call the public hearing on the budget to order. Um, just a couple of <coughs> announcements, general announcements, um, as we've done in the past with the budget workshops that we've had over the last several months, um, we'll allow, after Mr. Pacella's presentation, we'll allow um, three minutes per speaker, we'll allow up to a half hour for public comment on the budget. And um, we do have four people signed up. I'll call those four people first, and then any time remaining, if there's anyone else that wants to make a comment on the budget presentation, you'll be able to do so at that time. So at this time, Mr. Pacella, I'm going to turn it over to you. Concerns coming into this year was the minimal increase in state aid. The total increase that we that we experienced was one million seventy four thousand nine hundred and seventeen dollars. We had an increase in retirement pension factors. The TRS, the Teacher Retirement System, uh, increase was four point seven six five. The Employees Retirement System increase was one point oh sixty. The increase in the health insurance premiums that estimated increase was three point six million. And the contractual salaries increase based on triborough law uh, was another factor, another major concern. That estimated increase was roughly 1987000 And the last large major concern, which everyone knows about, was the charter school tuition requirement. That was at, based on their projected enrollment of 105 students was set at $1.554 million. So just to compare the state aid um, that's been kicked around in the Senate and the battle that continues up in Albany, You'll see that our foundation aid increase is really only 273,000, 274,000. And the gap elimination adjustment that everyone keeps talking about throughout the state, we have to be saw an increase of 2.87 million. Um, so there's been talk at the Senate that over the next four years they want to eliminate that gap. Well, the first year we were told that we were going to have 70% of that restored, which is why we started delaying some of the budget meetings because 70% of the original $12 million, you can see it's very significant when you're talking about closing schools or programs. So it was the board's decision to actually just put them off until we got the final numbers, and the final numbers came in, and they weren't as high as we experienced. So the net amount that we received in total state aid is only $1,074,000 difference from the prior year without the building aid of $3.5 million because the building aid is tied to the propositions that were voted on and approved by the voters in the prior years. So the maximum budget to conform to the tax cap based on the law set up for the 2% tax. A preliminary budget which we rolled over, the triborough laws, uh, costing out the current program into next year's dollars, was set at almost $245 million. So $244,876,000 is the current cost for next year. The current program's cost in next year's dollars. We back out the local revenue of 5.9 million. That's money that we raised by tuition, um, interest, uh, interest on property taxes, pilots, anything else that drives that's not either tax based or state aid based. Deduct that from the current budget. Deduct the board of ed use of the fund balance, which was set at two million dollars, and it's the board's uh, decision to go another two million this year. The newly awarded grant funds, you've heard that management efficiency grant, we're going to appropriate 734000 of that to help offset some of the costs. And then the state aid without the pre-K, because the pre-K we run through the special aid grant, we do have a local share that funds this. Uh, so the total state aid that you deduct from this amount is $122,118,000. This is done to find out how much taxes we need in order to support the current program. You see the taxes needed after you deduct the revenue to offset that budget, the board would have to raise taxes 114 million. 
the tax cap that's allowed by law is only 105.5 million, which means you start off preliminary budget gap at $8,557,909. That was the task the board had to get down to the maximum amount that could be budgeted at $236,318,000. A budget to budget, that's only 3.43%. So how was this closed? At the first uh, real budget meeting, February 21st, the board agreed to eliminate 23 and a half positions, which saved uh, 2.166 million. At the April 18th budget meeting, this was again after we had received the final list from the state, uh, the board agreed to eliminate an additional 19.4 positions, and that cost savings was 3.2 or 3,170,000. The district secured a new health insurance plan that is equitable to the current plan. It's expected to save roughly 1,325,000, and we're hoping that increases over the next couple of years. We're still in negotiations uh, under some, uh, some of the contracts that we have. And the board reached an agreement with the NTA that if ratified by the members, uh, the the district could save roughly $1.9 million. So all those added up come to the $8,557,000, well, maybe a couple thousand dollars more. But that's how this budget was closed. The gap was closed. The positions that were lost for this year, the Central Office Business Department went down one, Central Office uh, Curriculum and Instruction, Clerical Staff is down one, the District's Clerk's Office, Clerk's Office is going down one. One, as Central Office Executive Director, we had uh, six vacant cleaning positions that we're not filling. The special ed uh, position is uh, from retirement. We're not going to backfill that one. The elementary and middle school reductions uh, at 15 and a half, that was done by looking at the class sizes and enrollments and the plan that was put in place the prior year. We go down 15 and a half positions there. The NFA uh, main and North campuses, their enrollment in some of the classes are going to be a uh, little, little more enhanced, be a little more effective. We can lose 14.4 positions there. And the district-wide instructional coaches will be going down two that will leave seven, which are funded by the title uh, grants. So a total of 42.9 positions. Uh, and you can see that not any program was eliminated. The budget breakdown, the state requires that we break into three components. The administrative uh, component, which includes all non-classroom expenses associated with operating schools, such as salaries, uh, benefits, supplies, equipment of district offices and school offices, as well as other district expenses for insurance, council, professional development, and other indirect costs for delivering the instruction. And then you have the major part of the budget, uh, which accounts for the bulk of it, obviously, is about 80% of the program which includes all expenses directly related to delivering instruction to the students. Uh, and that also includes benefits, their salaries, classroom transportation costs. And then finally, you have the capital, which includes all the costs associated with operating the buildings, which are the utilities and maintenance, uh, and the debt that we have outstanding from our prior propositions that were approved. So the big question that we've received over the, the course of the months is, what, what if the budget doesn't pass, okay? So we're looking here, this is our current budget, the proposed budget, and the contingent budget. You see we have to cut about $6.1 million down, because if the budget, the first budget gets defeated, the board will have the option to put out another budget, and that'll be in June, uh, which limits so the time that they have to act or react to what occurs. And then if that gets defeated, we're forced into this contingent budget of $230 million, because under the current Tax cap laws, taxes cannot go up. The current tax base right now is 100 million, 133,000. We're looking to increase to 105 to support this budget. If they get defeated, we have to back down to 100. And the tax cap law does not allow for contingent expenses. Or does not, sorry, does not account for exemptions that can occur. The current exemptions that we have right now at 3.574. That's the increase in the tenth teacher's retirement system pension and the capital levy uh, exemption of 1.1 million. The capital levy, just to explain a little further, is the actual amount of the debt as compared to the state aid we receive. The state aid, this is the first year the state aid is lower than our debt. So this is the first year taxpayers are being asked to fund the capital projects that have been, have been approved over the past few years. 
and any all other contingency rules will apply. <coughs> so I know I went through that fast because we've been going through this. So there any questions on the general school budget? Mr. Pasella, um, so what's the additional amount of money that the district would have to find if the budget were to go down and we were forced into that? Um, 6.14 million. On top of where we're already at right now, an additional 6.14. Yes, and that's found by taking the current proposed budget that's being put before the voters to what we're allowed to raise under taxes of 100 million. So you'd have to come to 6.1 million. We'd have to find reductions, cuts, whatever you want to call it. Now, it might be an additional 6.1 million. Yes, it would be a little less because at that point the strategy would put that $700,000 grant money that we're going to use back into special aid and have them fund some of the uh, expenses that we originally had. Uh, I planned on it because of the contingent rules. So it's, it's 6 million, and if the 700,000 can be used uh, specifically for the contingent rules, then that would be down from there. Or So you'd be looking at roughly 5.3 million, 5.4 million. There were two things you said that weren't uh, going to be the, where exemptions aren't allowed if it's contingency, and one was the retirement. Could you just explain the other part? Again? Yeah, there, there's two exemptions that currently are allowed: the TRS pension factor, and that amount because it's in excess of the two percent property tax. Um, we're expected to pay 2.41% of the estimated earnings at $99,758,000. So that gives us an exemption of $2,404,000. That you can raise taxes to fund that because the pension factor increased higher than the 2% tax cap. Okay, the other part is the capital, um, the capital tax levy, where we budget for the amount of bonds that we have to pay back our debt. And that amount, I don't, uh, I do have it. roughly $10,268,000 in our outstanding debt. And our building aid is not as much as that. So when your building aid is less than that, because the voters already approved it, the governor on, under this tax cap law has allowed you to raise taxes to cover that difference. In the contingency rule, you're not allowed. So even that difference of $1,170,000, will have to be absorbed by your current tax base of $100 million. Okay. Sure. Anything else? Anything else from the board? No. That's it for now, Mr. Okay. Proposition 2 is the work-free library budget. I'm going to go through it, but I do have um, Muriel Vertabella, current library director, here to answer any questions. And also, Chuck Thomas, the incoming library director, is here. Um, I guess as his first tutorial, trial by fire, Chuck. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So the Newburgh Free Library budget aligns with the school budget in that it proposes a $214,236 increase in tax levy. And this is the same, we apply the same tax percentage to the library budget as we did the general fund budget. However, under the 2% tax cap clause, this is slightly higher than the allowable amount for the library. So they're going to be required um, to have the 60% vote by you, the governing board, which has already occurred. So now we only need 50% uh, plus one for the majority of the voters to approve the library budget. It maintains the current services and programs. It maintains the branch currently located at the Newburgh Mall. There'll be uh, two additional part-time hires to cover this because we did this in the middle of the year last year. We didn't budget for it, but we did make uh, arrangements to have it covered. And it uses the fund balance to close the budget cap, which uh, caused by which is caused by the super cent property tax. So here's their financial statements, their balanced budget. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the property tax went up 214,000. Everything else is kind of stagnant. It means the same. The other large change, obviously, is due to contractual issues. We're going to increase to 255,000, and then the offset would certainly be um, used by fund balance. 
So it's pretty straightforward. It's nothing uh, different than the prior years. There's been no major uh, adjustments, which we're fortunate. I mean, the library runs very efficiently. Uh, so that's, that's that. Library, any questions on the library? Third proposition, it deals with the security improvements and upgrades. Shall the Board of Ed of the New York and City School District in New York be authorized to perform safety and security repairs, renovations, construction improvements to the building and facilities of the school district, including but not limited to building access entrance, vestibule construction and renovations, installation, repair, and upgrades of building access controls and security measures, including incidental costs related thereto, at a maximum estimated cost of <coughs> 20000 to be funded from the withdrawal of $1,112,479 plus interest from the district capital reserve fund. Um, there's no tax impact on this proposition. That's important because we've had this capital reserve fund since I believe I got here in 1992 and it's been as high, it's been much higher than it currently is. So the board has decided to use this fund to upgrade to the security measures based on recent uh, occurrences throughout our area. Uh, it can only be, these funds can only be expended by a public vote for the purpose of facilities upgrades and renovations, such as this proposition. Uh, I think this was a very well thought out plan by the board uh, to use these funds to enhance our buildings. We do currently have vestibules that are working uh, great at two of our hill schools and some of our other elementary schools. As you know, the board reduced some of the extra earnings lines. Uh, so next year, backfilling some subs uh, Backfilling subs for security personnel that are currently full time in some of our schools may be a problem. So, with this vestibule construction, um, we're hoping to put in a camera system and a buzzer system with these and building out kind of like a, um, a waiting room, if you will, before you go into the main part to separate them from the, the, the population of the students. Um, I already covered the current events um, to increase security measures of the buildings been decided that the security guard is remaining in the elementary school for next year, but looking down the road as we start planning and to see how this works, this may be a, a, a different option than a full-time security guard each, but again, only time will tell and we'll, we'll monitor it and we'll do a full assessment of the district as we go on. And also in regards to that, Mr. Pacella, um, in keeping the um, full-time security guards in the elementary schools, without adding any additional staff because of budgetary right. constraints, then they're going to be used from other secondary buildings. Right. So there are going to be gaps at that level uh, to address having a full time at the elementary level. And so this was to, again, increase security and help to, to cover that. That's correct. Well, and we'll monitor that situation also. The bulk of them are gonna be coming out of the high school uh, and the middle schools. And again, we'll monitor them and with these vestibules, we're hoping that we'll be able to, to manage properly. That concludes tonight's presentation. Any other questions from the board? Yes, Mr. Levinson. If I can continue on that point. Uh, the building A is going, is it been going down the past couple of years and that expense is going up or no? No, the building A is tied is tied to the dormitory authority and the way they fund the building aid. Um, and they've changed it over the years plenty of times. It used to be funded, and we used to borrow according to the way their schedules were for their amortization of the bonds. And then when they changed it, we refinanced a few years ago to make sure that our building, our debt, was tied to the aid. Because they have, a, they have next year, we are, they already know how much aid we're getting. And it's based on your closed projects, your current projects that are in, in um, in, in Q, and what we try to do in the business office is to analyze exactly when this is going to hit, and this is the first year that it's actually hit, that the aid is actually higher than, and lower than your debt, and, and it has to do with the, the current construction going on. We've had to go out, go out and get bond anticipation notes, bans, and they have to be repaid after a year, you renew them, and there's significant interest on those. My question though is, is, is the gap going to be spreading in future years no. or not? No, if that's the case, then we'll review it again and we may actually have to go on and finance. Because it's, they're under, 
they're under discussions to change the way they fund it again. And actually it was, it was vetoed, it wasn't vetoed. The governor wanted it done, but the Senate came in and squashed the language. They wanted to lower and spread out the payments again. You know, most of the districts in New York are going out 20 and 30 years, but the payment back on the, the, the state is, you know, longer than that. So they're, they're trying to change the way they fund it because they don't have any money. So what they're doing is making the districts go out and test the market to try to refinance their current debt. So we'll, we'll keep an eye on that also. And if it starts, if the gap starts widening, then we'll certainly have to address it. We have fiscal advisors who actually, actually look at that for us. Sure. <coughs> Questions from the board? Begin our 30 minutes of public comment and um, three minutes per speaker. And we'll start with Ms. Robin Guzman. Greg, can you get the mic for her? I have questions, I guess, kind of. 
Um, part of you know what we just saw a presentation on had you know you gave a little bit about what happens if the the um, community votes down the budget, um, but the teachers haven't. We don't know where they stand on ratifying their contracts. So I was kind of hoping that you know by now we would have some idea of kind of maybe what might happen. You know, I guess what might happen if each thing doesn't happen because I feel like at the last um, one of the last meetings that we had, it was kind of announced, well, the school shouldn't close, you know, no school should have to close, and there should be full day kindergarten, but that's kind of based on two maybes. Um, and so, you know, we'll, we'll know what, where the teachers' um, negotiations stand before the vote, um, but that won't, we won't hear from you in that interim time. So, you know, if there was some information that you could share about that or, you know, I don't know, just not leaving us kind of not knowing, okay, now we get, we might get the new information, but then we don't know what that means and we're voting. Um, so that was, I guess, my question. question. Um, I guess the other thing was, um, there was about the administrative program and capital part. Um, I didn't quite understand, it seemed like teacher salaries were in with the administrative part or no? Or I could, and I'll just have, I have one other question, and then you can, okay. however the time goes, I don't sure. want to expire that. Um, then you were saying that um, something about there were some exceptions, but not if we're on a contingency budget. So I wasn't sure, does that mean if you put it up for budget twice, then you can't raise taxes to cover that part? Or when you're in contingent and when you can, uh, I, it seemed like there was some risk in putting the budget up twice versus maybe just having it once, so if you could clarify that too. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, I'll start with the easy one, the three part. Uh, the administrative, the program, and the capital. Required to set up the budget in three different components. Mm -hmm. Your administrative is dealing with your principals, your central office staff, your um, clerical that's not uh, within the the realm of delivering instruction. Your program is your instruction. Everything that's directly related to the student, the teacher, the teaching assistants, the supplies, and everything like that. And then your capital component are your utilities, everything to run the building. Basically, you're building the grounds. Okay. Um, and also your debt service. Okay. Okay, so that that's helps a to clarify that part. Thank you. Okay, so that, that's required, and every school district has to do that. And it comes into play in a contingent budget, so I'll, I'll work into that. So, say, don't jump. Thank you. Thank you. No, he can answer. Right. And he can answer. You're done talking within three minutes. But I don't want everybody to jump like I did. Okay. Thank you. 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 Total in the current year, you can't increase. So, just for argument's sake, if our current administrative cost is 12.1 percent, and I think I'm real close with that number, 12.1 percent, that's the total administrative cost to run the whole district. In a contingent budget, if the budget gets defeated twice, then that administrative expense cannot increase. It still has to maintain at 12.1 percent or lower. So, that's where those three part components come into play in an austerity budget or a contingent budget. With the, with your, are you clear with that? Yeah. Okay, so if the budget gets defeated the second time, then you're automatically put into a contingent budget. And in the contingent budget under the 2% tax cap laws that went into effect last year, you cannot raise taxes $1 more than your current year. So, and, and on top of that, you are not allowed any exemptions. You have to work in the increased teacher's retirement system pension and the debt service uh, variance. So you'd have to work in that, I think it's uh, 3 point something. 3 point yeah, something. 3.2 yeah. something. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, 3.5 million. That 3.5 million has to come out of the current tax roll, the current tax base. So we're not allowed to raise taxes to even cover those. That's where we come out with that uh, 6.1 6 million. Additional on what we already had to cut, right? And then, if, if the first budget gets defeated, 
the board decides that they want to put up a second budget um, at that <coughs> time. I know that obviously it's the 21st of May and shortly thereafter, if the budget gets defeated, I'm sure the board will get together to decide what they want to do in the whole. And if they want to put out another budget, that's fine. That, that goes out and their options are to put out the same one, reduce it, or they can actually increase that budget to go out. If that gets defeated, then they don't have a choice. Then you're automatically put in contingency uh, budget, then the choices become upon the board, how do you now balance the budget when you have to take out $6.1 million? Which leads me into your original question, your first question, the ARC and NPA, uh, contract ratification. Uh, the, the active members, from what I understand, and certainly HR is here, they can you know, correct me if I'm wrong, they had their active members vote last Tuesday. But they had they allowed for an additional week for their absentee ballot ballots for their retirees to send in. So that is not being counted, I guess, until tomorrow. So tomorrow evening or Wednesday, we may know if the contract is ratified. Hopefully, it's ratified, and then the budget is complete. Budget's complete anyway, up through the May 21st, because the budget is the budget, and the budget's made based on all the information you have at that point. So we had at that point the NTA leadership indicating that this is what they're proposing in the ratification. So the budget was built based on that. If that doesn't occur before the budget vote, the budget vote still goes out under the current budget. So what you're asking, I guess, is would we reduce that if the contract's not ratified? By law, we can't. April 25th is the deadline for that budget, and that can't be changed up through that vote. Now, you're voting on the program, not on program as presented, not on the taxes, the amount of taxes that you need to raise for that. You're not voting on cuts. And remember, if it gets defeated, then you have a bigger problem going into June. So the board will decide what happens after the budget vote on May 21st, if it's passed, if it's not passed, and then they'll have another decision if that ratification is not done. But that also will be done after the 21st. Just one quick question, clarification. Just if they put it up, if you put it up once, but you don't put it up a second time, can you do the exemptions? No, you're automatically in continue. Okay. There's a question. Can I ask a question? Do I get credit for pushing her? No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you're last week that the school districts across the county and the whole area will be losing about between 5 and 20 percent of the enrollment over the next seven years. And I heard Mr. Pacella say a couple months ago that running a school district is like running a business. And I, I agree with that. So as a business, when your customers are not coming in, you have to come up with ways to entice new customers to come in. And I don't see as a district us bringing in students from other areas to say they want to come and learn in the Newberry School District. We need something different, something new that maybe hasn't been thought of before. And I don't know if you know, I, I am a supporter of the IB program in the elementary school, but we need at the middle school and high school level an IB program not just a regular IB program within the schools that we have now at South and Heritage and NFA, but a new school, separate new school, small school, maybe one class per grade from sixth, seventh, eighth, all the way through 12th grade that would be in a partnership possibly with SUNY Orange on the Broadway campus, separate school, we can use the existing teachers that we have because we're going to take students from the top students from our existing classes and also, just like they have in New York City, 
Stuyvesant, Townsend Harris, Bronx High School Science, have the students within the area apply to those to this school and be accepted. And then we can have something that there's nothing like it in Hudson Valley that I know of. Maybe you, you know of something like this, but we need something that's going to attract students to say, we want to learn in this district. We want something here in Newburgh that has never, it hadn't, if it hasn't been done before, great, then we can be the first. But let's do something different. Let's get something exciting about Newburgh. Yes, we have our AP program. Yes, we have our honors program. But let's do something different that, you know, it's been proven in other areas that they're fighting. There's 10,000 applicants for one school. And those few hundred that get in, they're at the tops of their class. And we have, uh, you know, those schools are tops in New York City. So let's do something like that here and run it as a business, attract new customers, and if the program is successful, which I think it would be, then you can expand it to have more than just one class per grade or two classes per grade. But uh, have this, the partnership with SUNY Orange right there on Broadway, have the high school students take classes with the college students, have the middle school students take classes with the high school students. Let's have something, you know, show them that we can trust them, that we can have something that's more mature than what we have right now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trudine. Ms. Melissa Lamar. I was recently told by a parent that the suggestions to the Board of Ed about which schools to consider for closure rested solely on which school would be easy enough to close due to class to, due to its size. As you know, I'm against the closure of any elementary school and sincerely hope you've moved beyond those considerations. Closing elementary schools and raising class sizes in a district like ours at a time like this, when we're trying to meet higher expectations than we ever have before, is simply illogical. Further, research has proven time and again that small schools correlate directly to better achievement for students in poverty. In fact, this research finding has been declared amongst the most consistent ever to be reported in educational research. So to target small schools for closure simply to make a transition easier is kind of uninformed in my eyes. A sensible alternative would have been to take apart a larger school, maybe one that isn't performing as well, put part of the school into one of the other vacant small schools you have closed in the recent past, and redistribute the other students. Does your decision about closing elementary schools rely on any educational research findings, and if so, which ones? Or was this decision pure, purely made based on finance? If the latter, I'd like to know what's keeping the board um, from considering the body of, of available educational research when making decisions about the budget, because it seems to me that education should be the paramount in your, con in your considerations. That really is our business, if you want to talk about us being in business. In my review of reports of districts with challenges similar to ours that have been able to turn around and succeed, there's something called reciprocal accountability, meaning that standards for schools are set and administrators are held accountable for providing resources. It's one of their basic tenets in turning those schools around. Transparency in the, de the development of a culture of trust in buildings and between all departments is another one of those tenets. These are areas we greatly need to improve if we have hope for real change in Newburgh. Very often, I feel there is a reliance on top-down directives in order to meet funding requirements, rather than on what successful districts around the world have, which are collaborative learning communities, in which goals are set and resources are painstakingly aligned. While I understand that money is a primary worry in today's world, what is more valuable, and we are, what we are more at a deficit for than money right now, in my mind, is a truly important conversation about how to improve education in Newburgh between all the stakeholders. Um, in light of, of the need for transparency, my, my, another question I would have is, is there a way to have a public annual accounting of actual expenses, not projections, but what we actually spend so that we have the transparency we need for a real crack collaboration from all players? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mark. I would just like to assure you that the board certainly has looked beyond strictly enrollment in the building. And we are very aware of the benefits, obviously, to smaller class sizes. And education is our business, and our primary focus is our students and providing the best education possible. So thank you. Yes. 
Yeah, I just want to respond to the, one of your last statements with regards to the actual expenditures. Every year we're required to go through an audit of our actual expenditures, and our audit report is filed with New York State, and it indicates by line all the expenditures, and it's available if you'd like to have it. I can get you an audit copy of the audit report. So we just have to ask you for it? Yeah. Okay, I'll okay. send you an email. Sure. Mr. Ryan Lamar. That's my husband. He was only if I went over. Thank okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Anyone else that would like to um, make public comment, please come to the podium and give your name and address. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like public comment? Ms. Guzman? 
clarify, I think what Mr. Casella used when I was speaking kind of said was when the public votes, we're voting for that amount of money. We're voting Correct. For, a, a, for our taxes to increase, we're, we're voting for that. And then how that exactly gets spent is up to you to decide. It's up to you to decide whether if it gets bad, however, the, however that gets ironed out. I, is that what? Yes, that's correct. So us voting is making an actual decision. It's the deciding to raise taxes to to spend that and approving of spending that amount of money. Correct. But you're voting on the amount of money, not the program that it represents, because the board can always change that. That's within their authority, even during the year. So that's what you're voting on. Is the amount of money correct? Can you, can you come up and give your name and address, please? Walker Sussman, 256 Passaic Avenue. My question is this If the budget, first of all, I'm all for being optimistic and hopeful. Okay. But if the budget, because we hear all kinds of talk, mm -hmm. I'm in the district, everybody's talking. If the budget gets voted down, I mean, if the teachers don't ratify this, okay? So basically, we're still short whatever they were going to say, $6 million to $5 million. Oh, it was 1.9. Oh, 1.9, I'm sorry. Right. I'm sorry. So then that, does that put us back at the drawing board for closing the school? I don't want to cause a panic. Yeah. That's my one question. My other question is, is there a time limit or a time frame on saying, Okay, well, if we can't come up with the money, money this way, then yes, we're going to have to go down that road of closing the school. And where is that time frame, given the budget becomes effective July 1st? Correct, right? July 1st? Right. The, the, the teacher contract being ratified would save $1.9 million. Certainly, we know the cost of the school is over $5 million. It wouldn't be my recommendation to close the school to try to recover $1.9 million. So, again, as by council, they would go back to the drawing board to find out how we can balance the budget if we don't have that $1.9 million savings, and that would be up to the board. After the May 21st vote, it would be up to the board to maybe balance, if it doesn't get ratified, balance it, go and putting forth a new one in June. Uh, and if that one doesn't get passed, then it's strictly in their in their court, and they have to find $6 million. And at that point, I can almost assure you a school will close, because We've, we've turned this budget upside down to try to find, you know, just three million. And through the efforts and collaboration of everyone involved, we, we were able to do that. Now, if that doesn't come forward, then, you know, certain items will have to be put back and stable to balance it. The timeline will be, yeah, probably before July 1st. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak or make a comment? <coughs> Andrew Johnston, uh, I just have two, two quick questions. One, uh, could you say a little bit more about the bond anticipation notes, the principal interest? Uh, it seems like a big step up from what it was, what it was last year. I guess it was 150000 and this year it's $1.4 million. And uh, on the revenue side, uh, I know for many years the district has included in its revenue $2 million from fund reserve, and they do the same thing uh, in, in the budget proposal for this year. Can you say uh, when that fund is going to run out of money and what are the consequences when that happens? Thank you. Um, with regards to bands, we have current capital construction going on and that we didn't long-term bond it yet. So what we do as a stock gap to pay the bills and the contractors, we go out for a band. And it's a little bit higher because we had a little more construction this past year. We didn't have time to go to long-term bonds because we're waiting to see what happened up at the state with the way they aligned their aid package. So this particular year is higher uh, for this bond anticipation note. We expect to bond it long-term next year, which would obviously pay the ban. You know, it's, it's, I've been doing it for 20 years, so if I'm going too fast, stop me. The ban is to pay your bills. The bond is long-term to set out kind of like your amortization schedule to align with your aid. So it's kind of a short-term uh, borrowing to pay out your, your contractors. Yeah, I guess, I guess my question is, uh, would we expect it to be as high as this next year, or would we expect it to be different next year? No, I don't expect it to be any unless we have additional construction. 
Again, it's just for cash flow purposes because we don't have the money to upfront the contract costs. So, so we don't we don't have any propositions no. coming forward to do any more work. So <laughs> right, if if work is done during the summer that was still based on the propositions that were passed, like I don't have that schedule in front of me. That would be the only reason why we could ban uh, a project. Or if the market is not conducive to actually long-term bonding it because of whatever, for whatever reason, but our fiscal advisor will advise it. If the interest rates are too high and it won't align to the state, then we'll, we'll evaluate it and maybe just float another ban uh, so that we can reap the benefit of a lower interest rate. Because each year, around the end of the year, I get a call from Moody's or um, AM Best or any other ratings, Standard & Poor's, to they evaluate our books. And based on our rating, we'll determine how we can borrow money. Either it's low with a, a good rating or it's high, and certainly you know the city of Newburgh has been dealing with that. You'll end up with a high interest rate if your rating is poor. Which, what we try to do is we try to keep our fund balance at a certain level. The state says you can only keep it at 4% unappropriated, that's by law. That is going down. So I try to smooth, schmooze some of these rating companies to keep our rate <coughs> where it is so that we don't get hit by the tax rate doesn't get hit by the high interest rates. But it's getting harder and harder as we start dwindling that fund balance, which leads me into your other area of the fund balance. Where do I see this happening? Based on this tax cap laws and the fund balance and the reserves that we're using, I'd say within three to five years where it should be depleted. And you ask what is the the yeah, the impact of that, or the consequence of that. The consequences? Yeah. The state doesn't know yet. So I don't know. I really don't. When we ask the senators or the state, are you ready to take over the 70% of the New York State school district that will be insolvent within three years? And they said they don't have an idea. So They don't have a plan because they said it's not going to happen, which is kind of mind-boggling to me, but that was their answer. We don't have to worry about that because that's not going to happen. Well, actually, it already has started happening and it is going to happen. So it's kind of scary that they don't have a plan for this. Is there anyone that would make like to make one last comment on the budget? If not, we'll close the public hearing on the budget, and I thank you all for being here and wanting to be informed and for asking questions, and I continue to ask you to go out and share any information that you've learned and clear up any misinformation that's out there. So thank you very much.